KUAF has always been about people with passions. We were up against almost no budget and no help and not a whole lot of know-how, but we did it anyway. We, I think, probably tested more than the FCC sort of expected. They were expecting, you know, tones and all this kind of, well, we were, we were broadcasting rock and roll. You know, radio has survived a lot. Drive-in theaters, television, it was all going to, XM, Sirius, all going to kill radio. But radio just keeps on happening. That's a really big deal. What community are you operating in? And we operate in, a, in an awesome community that's growing and just getting better and better. And it's a perfect place for public radio. In 1924, radio would come to the campus of the University of Arkansas for the first time when students in the College of Engineering founded KFMQ. The history of radio on campus goes all the way back to the early 1900s. Uh, the College of Engineering, as with other uh, engineering kind of research, they began looking at uh, radio waves and how to use that and how to experiment with it. For the most part, they, when they started, their experiments, they were looking at radio as a one-to-one -one kind of transmission. You're trying to pick up a, a, a signal from somebody else and get that message. They weren't thinking of a, about it in broadcast terms, but over the early part of the 20th century, broadcast is how radio evolved. And uh, the University of Arkansas got its first radio station in 1924. Its uh, call letters were KFMQ. Uh, it was just randomly assigned those letters. In 1926, they got new uh, call letters uh, that were KUOA, uh, something that uh, looked more like the University of Arkansas. They broadcast uh, um, all over the country. Uh, they had a large enough transmitter, and they had a the engineering college had a, a, in their electrical engineering program had a student named Loy Barton who experimented with how to increase the uh, uh, effective range of broadcasts, and he. Uh, is one of the early inventors of a, of a system that really amped up what a uh, radio station could do. And the radio station here um, got letters from as far as away as Alberta, Canada, uh, from people who were listening. The station that um, was created, uh, the building that housed the radio station, burned down in the uh, early 1930s. And the university decided maybe this wasn't something they should be doing anyway. So they sold the station to some uh, private owners who operated it on the Fayetteville Square for a period and then it got sold to John Brown University, uh, which still owns the, that radio station. After selling KUOA to John Brown University in 1933, decades would go by before the changing music scene of the 1960s inspired students to create their own radio station. Probably uh, 30 years went by uh, before students on campus started looking at trying to create their own radio station. And uh, at just that same time, the journalism department was looking at expanding its curriculum. And so they hired a professor named Dennis O'Neill. And Dennis was brought in, A, to start teaching a broadcast sequence. Part of his job was to get a, a student radio station up and running. And uh, so they went at it, and uh, they went on the air, and uh, have been on the air ever since. In 1973, after 40 years of radio silence on campus, KUAF would go on the air for the first time. Well, of course, when I uh, got started on this project, KUAF didn't exist. Um, my motivation was because of a void uh, in northwest Arkansas of radio stations that appealed to uh, high school and uh, college age students. I was into rock and roll and, and some pop. The guys in the dorm would, uh, we had a, a little underground, I don't know, maybe it was five watts, just barely covered the dorm uh, station. To, to get that all going, uh, I recruited uh, guys from Yoakum Hall and uh, some of the girls from Humphreys Hall, which was next door, and they came and, and we put carpet on the wall, old used carpet. Nothing, nothing was new except for we did manage to get ASG provided money and I think the university provided some money so we did have 
new turntables, a new control board, a couple of reel-to-reel -reel tape decks. It was all volunteers. Uh, we had a lot of students that volunteered to do uh, rock shows and I trained all those folks. Uh, very few, if any of them, had ever sat in front of a control board before. We tried to sound professional. No dedications. We're going to try and talk about the artists, talk about the albums. So we had a, a, a classical block, a jazz, folk. We had a soul show. I guess that was, you know, one uh, short of just getting the station on the air and making it work and making it sound professional with a bunch of volunteer amateurs. Uh, that one of my one of my best feelings of accomplishment was just that we changed the lives and found a new sense of direction for a number of students that, um, you know, would have been the would have been the guys that never got to do something they loved. When Rick came, well, his passion was bringing NPR to Northwest Arkansas, and that was a real turning point at at uh, changing KUAF from a student station to a Northwest Arkansas station. In 1985, KUAF transitioned from a student station to the region's first NPR affiliate. We started out in a little old house where Champions Hall is now. It was right on the corner. It was a old two-story house. It had been a rooming house once upon a time. Um, there, I remember meeting an elderly woman once who said that she lived there when she was in college at the university, you know, back in the 30s or the 40s, something like that. So anyway, um, that house, uh, that building was falling apart and the university had no, re no interest in maintaining it. And in fact, when we moved out of there, the last time it rained, I went around and counted and we had 31 cups and buckets and, and uh, you know, trash cans to collect the water that would come through the roof. The, the old Duncan Street, 103 North Duncan, was, uh, was falling apart. Uh, we had cans to catch the rain and, and uh, oh, there were drafts. I mean, it was, it was really uh, in incredibly bad shape. Uh, but the show went on. When we started, we were 100 watts, pretty much covered Fayetteville. That was about it. Didn't have a, a, a staff to speak of, a paid staff. There was one full-time person and myself. And I went to Washington and visited some people at NPR and tried to convince them that if they let us have their programming at a reasonable price, that we could build the station. We could develop an audience with NPR news programming and eventually start fundraising and build the station. And they, they agreed and they thought it was okay. The format of the station has stayed fairly the same since 1985. The only changes since then has been more power, higher power transmitters, and then we've developed more local programming um, since we started. And uh, we currently have a daily news program called Ozarks at Large, and that's sort of our flagship uh, program, local program on KUAF. The Arkansas Razorback soccer team opens play at the SEC tournament in Orange Beach, Alabama this afternoon. Arkansas, the number three seed, faces sixth seed at Vanderbilt at 2.30, the winner advancing to the semifinals to be played Friday evening. There is a I produce a, a daily radio program called Ozarks at Large, which there's no real quick way to describe what it is. I used to tell people it's a news magazine, but that doesn't quite work. We have musicians, we do news stories, we have interviews. It fills 60 minutes of radio time, and one of the great things about it is we get to do with it what we want. I first came to KUAF when I was a freshman in college in 1981, and it was a 10-watt student-run station, and stayed here for five years. When I left school, worked for a couple of years in Mountain Home at a radio station there, worked for a year at Kix 104, then came back as a full-time adult, I guess, full, a paid employee, starting in August first 1989 and I've been here since. So what is that, 27 years? 27 plus years. Yeah, that's a long time.
By, by the time I'm here in the morning, it's a lot of writing. It's a lot of moving the elements around. It's on, it, we do it in audio software, so you know, it's not the old days of cutting real real tape with a razor blade. And often, you know, what's the old saying, man makes plans and God laughs? I'll come in and I think this is going to be the show, and it can be halfway scrapped before you're done. But it's me sitting down, writing, manipulating the audio files in the computer on the screen, putting it together, getting it to 53 minutes and 59 seconds, and doing that before 12 o'clock. The show itself doesn't really start till 12.06, so I could, we have proven, I could get the show in at 12.05.30 and it still gets on the air. We never want to do that again. That show gets uh, pre-recorded and loaded in the computer, hopefully before noon. Sometimes he gets half of it in and then he's still working on it while the first one half is playing and then he gets the second half in before 12.30 and, and fills up. It gets kind of close sometimes. But you know, that's the nature of, of what we do in the news business. There's always a deadline and sometimes you work right up against it. One of the things you learn is that you always can get a show on. And so the panic is gone. I mean, there was one day where it was about 11.20, and there was still half a show. I mean, we had had three different things fall apart. But, you know, everyone who's done that, if you put together a daily newspaper, if you put together, you know, the, the TV producers who put together four or five newscasts a week, you've all, everyone's had that happen. And after you've done it for a while, you just, okay, this won't be our best show, but there will be something. In the year 2000, Student radio would finally return to campus after 15 years with the founding of KXUA. There was a period after KUAF went, became a, an NPR affiliate, they looked at trying to create another student radio station. And initially, uh, there were some issues trying to get a license. There was a, a, another local group trying to get the same uh, frequency. KRZR was sort of a stopgap measure while they were trying to apply for a uh, a new FCC license to broadcast on a different frequency than KUAF. And they initially applied for, I think it was 90.1. And this other organization, uh, um, a uh, religious organization that wanted to broadcast um, religious material, also applied for the 90.1 um, frequency. And so it took a while to sort it out, but um, both, both entities also applied for 88.3 FM. And they eventually compromised and said, okay, you get this one and we'll get this one. And when they made that uh, decision, KRZR disappeared and uh, they re rechristened it uh, KXUA and put it to good use uh, on campus and uh, eventually got the FCC license uh, um, settled out uh, by the year 2000 and went on the air on April 1st. Well, uh, the, when they went on the air on April 1st in 2000, uh, the DJs uh, let the listeners know that the FCC would not allow them to play music. And they spent the whole day playing patriotic speeches. <laughs> and, and the next day, the, the radio staff let everybody know that it was just, a, just an April Fool's prank. <laughs> it is Monday, October 17th, 2016. And this, again, is the Drive-In Speaker Box, the best in film scores, soundtracks, DVD news, movie reviews, and everything in between. I'm your host, The Boom Operator. Well, my history here at KXUA has kind of been a really long, long story. I've been here uh, since the debut of the station back in 2000. And uh, day one on the air, flipped the switch, and I was just a young young guy, just interested in being a DJ on a radio station. And I was there day one and been there ever since. I've had a couple of different shows, uh, one of the longest running shows on the air. And we've got another great show for you tonight. We are continuing on our roll of the October editions of the Drive-In Speaker Box, some of my favorite episodes where we... Kind of it's called the Drive-In Speaker Box, and it's a film score, movie review, soundtrack show. Uh, but I was station manager for about two and a half years. I've been on the uh, music board for a couple of years. Uh, pretty much every bit of in, in and out of the station, uh, there's a lot of me in these walls, and uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to let go of it. I'm just always, I'm always around. I feel like I'm in the walls. Uh, you know, I, did you see the Pompeii movie No. with Kit Harrington? It was garbage. It was so In 2000, we had a pretty rough shambling crew, uh, but we were making it work and we weren't even in this spot. We were kind of next door and uh, we were just 
did what we had with what we had, and we didn't have a whole lot of money to work with. Uh, we were combating uh, American family broadcasters, I think, because they wanted 88.3 as well, and so there was legal stuff going on, and we were a registered student organization. We weren't even student media then, uh, but over the course of the years, we just refined it and got better and got more um, legitimate and have been uh, kind of a force in the music scene here uh, ever since. One of my favorite accomplishments, it was right on the cusp of the internet being adopted by everybody. Smartphones were coming around, the internet was becoming more regular, Facebook was still in its infancy, and we were just trying to figure out how to update our station to the, the modern times. And we kind of launched a web stream. We had things, uh, online automation, our catalog was online. And it was going, it was making that transition from pencil and paper to a more digital uh, world, which was really, really challenging, but we were able to make it happen. Welcome to the drive-in speaker box. It is another Monday night, it is eight o'clock. It well now, with technology being the way it is, music has really, really changed. The whole industry has changed, the way we make it, the way we consume it, everything's changing. And radio, uh, a lot of people think it's kind of a dying medium. And I, I don't necessarily think that. You know, in the world of uh, options, we, we have so many things. Just everything's customized. You know, Spotify, make your own playlist. Go to, you know, the pizza place. There's a thousand toppings. Like, everything is so customized. But what I found is people still like having someone curate their experience. And maybe you don't already know everything that's awesome. And so the role of a DJ, a tastemaker, and a trendsetter is still very, very valuable. And it's just radio needs to sort of be nimble and find those platforms, uh, find certain online uh, mediums and streaming services and podcasts. And uh, it, it's wearing a lot more hats, and radio's always had to wear a lot of hats. But to be able to navigate these different forms of music consumption technology and be the ones at the front of it and not the ones that are trying to catch up really late in the game I think is really really important. Speaking of those technologies for example on my show one thing that we've started recently is using an app called Periscope and it's basically live instant streaming kind of like Facebook Live or Busker or anything like that and we offer our audience a chance to see live video inside behind the scenes in the studio and when we're not on the air talking to our radio listeners we can answer questions directly from the stream and it's just another way that we can kind of stay ahead of that technology gap and make you know the radio still a really interesting uh, professional experience for the people that are consuming. The technology is is driving the way people use music now. You know, you can get on Pandora or uh, Spotify. You know, people, people build their own music libraries on their phones or their iPods or their whatever. So KUAF will exist, I think, for eon. Even with internet, even with Bluetooth, even with wireless, there will always be a reason to have not just KUAF but local radio. But it does change over time. You know, you had Top 40 radio. You had Charlie McCarthy or, or, or radio dramas. I think what KUAF's future, as far as we can see, and I think it's kind of foolish to try to envision much past 10 years, the way technology, and maybe even much past five, the way technology changes. I think what not just KUAF's future, but radio's future is local. Because... I can get so many things on my phone now, or on my laptop, or in my car through satellite radio, because I can get all those. What do I need a local radio station for? What can XM not do? What can Tuned In not do? Well, it can't give me local stuff. I think that's the future of radio. And, and, and we are uniquely positioned, because we're locally owned, because the, we're owned by the University of Arkansas, that our decisions can come from here and not from Atlanta or New York or L.A. The future of radio is local programming and community involvement, which really has been what has been kind of radio's backbone for 100 years. Competition is always a factor. Radio has been proclaimed dead many times over the years. Um, you know, newspapers felt threatened, so they wouldn't let radio play any news for a long time, and then radio kind of developed their own uh, news programming. And then television came along and everybody thought, well, radio's done. Well, radio just changed. And radio continues to change and evolve. And I feel like, you know, 
I mean, change seems to happen overnight, but it doesn't. And the, again, the need for people to have something in their ears as they're driving, as they're walking the trails, they're riding bikes, washing the dishes at night, whatever, that's never going to change. Um, so, I mean, I think our future is very bright. And I think we are sitting in a place with this building, the facilities that we have, the community that we're in, which is, I mean, that's a really big deal. What community are you operating in? And we operate in an, in an awesome community that's growing and just getting better and better. And it's a perfect place for public radio. Um, I think the future of public radio in Northwest Arkansas and at KUAF is very, very bright.